Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd, and welcome to the second episode of the History of Hull Docks. And in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the docks that grew around the city centre, the old town, known collectively as the Town Docks. As we saw in the last episode, in the 18th century, the old harbour, the river itself, was really starting to struggle to cope with the increased volume of trade that was coming in as a result of the industrialisation of the West Riding. To give you some idea of just how much that trade was growing, between 1716 and 1730, the amount of tonnage coming through the port was about 11,000 a year, and that stayed fairly even in that period. By 1751, that had gone up to 24,000 tonnes. It had more than doubled in only 20 years, and it showed no signs of slowing down. Something needed to happen. There was pressure being put on the bench of aldermen of the city to create a legal dock by the customs and excise people because smuggling was rife in this part of the town. There are even today urban legends of tunnels that came from the river all the way to various public houses in the old town for smugglers to use. So they were petitioning very strongly to have a new dock with a legal key, somewhere they could patrol and make sure that customs evasion was minimised. But likewise, Trinity House and various merchants across the city were also lobbying the bench of aldermen because of the chaos that was happening unloading and loading ships in the harbour. It was a detriment to their business, it was a problem logistically and it was creating safety hazards with ships crashing into one another. Something had to be done and in 1774 something was. Finally in 1772 the bench recognised the representations of Trinity House on the poor condition of the haven and began to solicit plans for a new dock. However there was infighting amongst those who wanted the dock. Merchants and ship owners were unhappy with the idea of a legal key blatantly arguing that having to pay customs would damage their profits, but their arguments were quelled when customs and excise threatened to build a new dock of their own outside of the city of Hull and away from their businesses somewhere else on the Humber. Finally, they all agreed on a plan and submitted the proposal to Parliament. In 1774, the Hull Dock Act was passed, authorising the building of the new dock. It also authorised the creation of a new company, the Hull Dock Company who would be responsible for the building, the administration of day-to-day -day running, and the funding of the dock. And to assist with this, they were given the rights to levy tonnage rates on ships that would use the dock. And in future years, this would prove to be an enormous source of income for the dock company. But the building of this dock and the placing of it necessitated the demolition of a whole stretch of the historic town walls that had stood for six, 700 years including the stretch between Northgate and the famous Beverly Gate, which was the main way in and out of the town, and was the place where 250 years earlier, Robert Constable had met a grizzly end hanging in a gibbet. But in its place would be the magnificent new floating dock, and it was called a floating dock because of the way that it was built. Basically, it was isolated from the tidal flow of the river that fed it by lock gates, so you could maintain a steady high level of water in the dock. And the advantage of this for shipping is that your ships aren't constantly bobbing up and down with the raising of the tide, causing problems for getting on and off the ship. And they're not bottoming out on mud flats at low tide and leaning away from the dockside precariously. And this fantastic feat of engineering was going to be the biggest dock of its kind in the entire country. 1,700 feet long, 250 feet wide and 25 feet deep. 
The dock was going to be designed by a pair of engineering legends, Henry Berry, who had already designed three fantastic docks in Liverpool, and John Grundy, a Lincolnshire man, who was not only responsible for docks, but also canals and drainage systems. And this amazing, fantastic new dock would be known across the length and breadth of the land by the new name, The Dock. They were good at naming things in the 1770s. As you might expect for such a huge engineering marvel, there were many hurdles to overcome. During the building, the north wall of the dock began to bulge alarmingly from slippage and subsidence, displacing by more than three feet in some places. This required deeper pilings to hold the walls straight. Berry had argued for deeper pilings from the start into the softer ground, but had been overruled by the chief engineer on the site, who, in retrospect, must have felt rather foolish. In 1776, the north wall of the Lock Bay collapsed entirely, requiring a complete rebuild. The lock into the dock proved troublesome. It was rebuilt completely in 1786, and once again in 1814 to try to deal with the structural issues that it faced. All of the earth excavated from the dock was spread out on the ground to the north of the dock, on which George Street and the surrounding area were built and there was a two-leaf drawbridge that allowed passage over the lock. This Dutch-style bridge could be opened within only 30 seconds. The dock itself was finished ahead of schedule, taking only four years to build rather than the seven that had been predicted, allowing it to open for trade in 1778. The huge ocean-going ships such as whalers and cargo vessels that needed the larger quayside, and of course who needed to pay customs duty, would use the dock and the smaller river barges and local coastal ships would use the old harbour. The future looked rosy. Except it wasn't. In a spectacularly short-sighted bit of forward planning, the entrance to the dock was here, all the way up the river hole. So the huge seagoing ships that were going to be using the docks in order to alleviate pressure on the old river had to go all the way up through the old river to get to the dock, shouldering past the chaotic throng of river barges and small ships that were crowded around the old staves. Collisions were commonplace, delays were endemic. In fact, in the 1820s, there were reports of uh, master mariners going on record as saying that it took them less time to sail from St. Petersburg to the Humber than it did to get from the Humber to the dock. And in the late 18th century, petitions were being made to build a canal all the way from the dock to the Humber itself in order to bypass the river. But things weren't going all according to plan in other directions either. To add insult to injury, the expected growth of trade didn't materialise at first because of the American War of Independence, which was having a real stifling effect on trade around Europe. But when that war ended, the exponential growth of industrialisation carried on. Just to give you an example of that, in 1783 the customs at the dock managed to claim £86,000 worth of, of duty. Only 10 years later in 1793 that had gone up to £200,000 in 10 years. Things were really looking up at that point. In fact the growth was so phenomenal that there was already a lot of pressure from Trinity House and merchants of Hull on the Hull Dock Company to build a second dock, this time preferably with an entrance from the Humber. But the Hull Docks Company was dragging its feet. Building docks is horrendously expensive and they were rather enjoying just being able to sit back and rake in profits from the huge amount of trade that was going on in the dock. But by 1802 they relented and the Hull Dock Act was passed which allowed for the building of a new dock on the banks of the Humber. But Hull Corporation put a stipulation into the act that required them to use some of the spoil from the excavation of this new dock to build out and reclaim land from the Humber. This new dock was to be capable of housing up to 70 ships and was again built on the site of the city's walls, this time requiring the demolition of the stretch of the western wall from around halfway down, right down to the point of Heselgate. The design of the dock was by William Chapman and John Rennie, who estimated the cost of the dock to be around £84,000, which is around £8 million in modern money. 
Many lessons had been learned from the building of the old dock. This time, much deeper and more substantial pilings were used, and the sides were placed at a shallow angle to better resist the pressure of the banks. There were still some issues, however, including subsidence in the lock due to a freshwater spring that was discovered during excavation, and the whole lock had to be rebuilt again in 1830 to finally tackle the issue. The extremely deep soft mud of the Humber bank also proved very troublesome to work with, and the Humber's silt heavy water which fed the dock, unlike the old dock which took more fresh water from the river hull, caused heavy silting of the dock itself. This particular challenge was engineered in brilliant engineering style by the construction of a special steam-powered dredging ship that could shift over 300 tonnes of mud a day down to a depth of 22 feet. That dredger lived in the dock and moved over 36,000 tonnes of silt from it every year. One of the big technical issues that they had to face was the stipulation that was in the act to use the spoil from the dock to build out and reclaim land from the Humber. This meant the building of enormous coffer dams out into the estuary to hold back the water while they worked. But it paid off, because where I'm standing now in Humber Street, this used to be the Humber foreshore, and everything to the south of me here used to be in the river. So we now have all of this land back. So it was a very forward thinking idea on the part of the corporation. But all of these technical challenges that this dock faced meant that costs spiralled well out from the original £84,000 budget that they'd quoted. In fact, if the original budget was about my height, it was so over budget that the final cost would end up knocking on the door of the International Space Station. The final cost was over £240,000. That's nearly £22 million in modern money. That's a hell of a lot of money to spend on a dock. And the ever frugal whole dock company must have been clutching their collective purses at that expenditure. What must have really made them worried was the fact that the 1802 Dock Act that authorised the building of this dock also had a provision in it that said that for any three years of trade, if the growth was the same as the growth in the three years prior to the building of this dock, then the whole docks company would have to build another dock, a third dock between the two existing docks. And that must have really got them worried because that was going to be expensive as well. Cost aside, this new dock opened in 1809 to the sound of bands playing and cannons firing. But then there remained the thorny issue of what to call it. Because Hull already had a dock called The Dock. What do you call this? The Other Dock? Well, they were still good at naming things in the early 19th century, so The Dock became renamed the old dock and this was called the new dock dead easy to remember that one and it certainly wouldn't cause any further confusion if they built any more docks once again the new docks early years were marred by the effects of war this time with france with tonnage through hull dropping from 210,000 in 1802 to a mere 79,000 in 1809 but as before, once the war had ended, the trade continued to explode, reaching 265,000 tonnes by 1815 and a massive 449,000 tonnes by 1825. And this triggered the part of the 1802 Act that required the whole dock company to build a third dock. But before we get to the building of the junction dock, we should perhaps stop to take a look at the kind of goods that were being imported and exported through Hull. There was the usual trade that had been going on for decades, oil cake and crops from the low countries, 
timber from Scandinavia that was mostly being shipped to the coalfields of South Yorkshire for use as pit props. The industrialisation of Britain depended on steam engines which were being driven by the coal from the ever-growing mines, and iron imports from the Baltic. But perhaps one of the most dominant trades that Hull was known for at this time was whaling. We covered Hull's early whaling in the last episode, but the trade disappeared after the Muscovy Company's successful attempts to ban Hull whaling ships from all of their main whaling grounds. But that was a long time ago, and by the mid-18th century, things were ripe for change. But the Muscovy Company's success in crushing the whaling trade of Hull in the 16th century was very short-lived, because only a short while after, the Dutch decided to get in on the whaling game, and they pretty much put the Muscovy Company out of business. No amount of lobbying the government could encourage the British government to lean on the Dutch the way that they had on homegrown threats like Hull and York, and they withdrew from the whaling trade altogether, shifting to different types of business in order to make their money. But by the 18th century, the Dutch themselves were being pushed out of the whaling industry by cheap imports of whale products, such as oil and whalebone, from the American colonies. And Britain became dependent on these imports. But those imports came to a grinding halt when the British colonies in America started having a war with the French colonies in America it kind of put a big dampener on all export across the Atlantic. And Britain was facing a serious shortage of oil. So several ship owners in Hull and several other ports across England and Scotland decided to take up the slack by outfitting ships for whaling for the first time in 150 years. Now we have to address something of an elephant or perhaps a whale in the room at this point. In the 21st century, we know that whaling is pretty bad. Whales are incredibly intelligent and emotional creatures, and hunting them has a catastrophic effect on their life cycle and their populations. And we have driven them to the brink of extinction by hunting them. But they didn't know those things in the 18th and 19th century. And we have to remember, this was a society whose moral compass was calibrated very, very differently to our own. These people sent six-year-old children to work in mines and bought and sold people from Africa as slaves. It wasn't even a particularly great world for human rights, let alone thinking about those of animals. So we have to bear in mind that when we're watching this, we need to put aside our 21st century sensibilities, our sadness, anger or outrage at the idea of hunting and view it with a historian's hat on and just look at the facts and think of it as just another piece of Hull's industry. Samuel Stanage, who owned several ships that had been converted into whaling ships during the stoppage, was not so easily deterred. He saw the potential for a homegrown trade that could compete against the American imports. And in a stunning example of putting your money where your mouth is, he kitted out one of his ships, the Berry, for an Arctic whaling expedition. So finely balanced was this move that if the Berry had sunk, not uncommon when hunting whales in the Arctic, he'd have lost everything. In fact, had it returned with only one whale, he would have been finished financially. As it was, when the berry returned to Hull, it had caught one whale, and over 300 seals, which, with their valuable skins and oil, made the voyage incredibly lucrative, and showed that there was indeed a viable and profitable trade in Arctic whaling to be competing with colonial imports. And it's probably a good thing that they did, because only a few years later, those imports stopped completely as the colonials decided to kick the British out in the American War of Independence. Hull's whaling fleet grew and grew. In 1784, 10% of England's whaling ships were from the city. By 1815, there were 57 whaling ships operating from Hull. That's a staggering 40% of the entire whaling fleet of Great Britain. It was at this time between 1814 and 1817 that Hull was the single largest whaling port in Britain, and one of the largest in Europe. But whilst the work was well rewarded when it was successful, there were seasons when it was not. In 1775, ten whalers sailed from Hull, and six of them returned with no whale catches at all. Two of the ships didn't return. 
having either been sunk by the whales they were trying to kill, or crushed by ice floes in the treacherous Arctic Ocean. It was a dangerous profession, and whilst it's often said that sailors are a breed apart from normal people, whalers are a breed apart from sailors. Single-minded and often seen as mad, a stereotype seen in Captain Ahab in the book Moby Dick, they were without a doubt tenacious and skilled mariners. But they often spent as little time ashore as they could, because those same qualities that made them good whale hunters also put them at the top of the list of the Navy's press gangs. Because the whaling trade was such a, a lucrative business, um, for particularly for the British government, um, whaling crews were issued with exemptions, which was supposed to be a, a safety net so that they weren't pressed into service. Um, obviously, press gangs still tried uh, to take them on board. Um, and you quite often hear of um, court cases being brought against ship's captains um, when they've tried to resist the press gangs. So in the late uh, 18th century, um, the method for catching a whale was to use a, a hand-thrown harpoon, which would anchor the animal. Um, it would be attached to a line, and the crew would hold on to the line, uh, chasing the whale until it got tired and the ship could be brought alongside it. Uh, at that point, other members of the crew would use a spear or a lance, um, basically to kill the animal, um, and then it would be towed back to the ship. Um, the whole process could take a couple of hours um, to actually chase down the whale before it got too tired. Um, once back at the ship, um, it would be sort of initially processed. So whilst at sea, uh, the crews would actually um, cut up the, the whale's uh, carcass um, and the blubber would be um, put into barrels to be taken back to port. Uh, once back in hull, um, the cargo was unloaded at Greenland Yards, which was about a mile down the river hull near Skullcoats. Um, here they would boil the blubber to make oil um, and the whale bones would be processed so they would be stripped and separated and cleaned. Um, at this point, you had quite a lot of the women got involved in the work. So whilst at sea, obviously, it was, it was man's work. Um, but once back at home, the women were there and became quite a vital part in, in this trade. But it was a trade that started to fall off after the glory years of the early 19th century due to a number of factors. Rapidly declining whale numbers meant longer and longer and therefore more dangerous hunting voyages, and the products that had been so essential from whales were rapidly becoming available elsewhere as byproducts of the Industrial Revolution, such as mineral oil for lamps instead of whale oil, and the increasing use of electricity for lighting, for instance. The real death knell for Hull's whaling industry came with the advent of newer steam-powered whaling vessels of the Scottish ports like Dundee that could move much faster and hunt further afield in a single trip than the sailing ships of Hull. By the late 1860s, there were only two whaling ships left in the port, the Diana and the True Love, and in 1869, tragedy struck the Diana as it returned home from a trip. It broke apart after beaching on Donna Nook just off the Lincolnshire coast, killing everyone on board. After this, Hull's participation in an industry that half a century earlier had dominated came to an end. The Hull Dock Company didn't drag its feet this time the way it had with the building of the Humber Dock. Instead, it actually started clearing the land for the building of this dock a lot earlier, in, as early as, as 1819, in fact. They started actually demolishing houses and sadly putting an end to Hull's cattle market, which used to be on the site. But there was another industry that was about to try making overtures in Hull. A consortium of businessmen from Leeds, Selby and Hull approached investors in Hull, asking for their help in funding a brand new project, a railway line that would link Selby and Leeds to Hull. The ever-growing West Riding City and its industrial manufacturing base required access to the docks. Speedy access, not just access up the canals, which could take days to arrive, 
They wanted the goods arriving in quantity the next day. That, unfortunately, didn't really pique the interests of those investors. They had a burgeoning doctrine. From their point of view, everything was going swimmingly, so they didn't really bother with that silly railroad company, newfangled daft thing anyway. They came to regret that in the next few years. But the needs for both a railway and another dock were thrown into sharp relief in the 1820s when, further up the Humber, a whole new town, complete with state-of-the-art docks and extensive canal access to the lucrative South Yorkshire coalfields via the air and colder navigation, opened. Ghoul. This new port town threatened Hull on two fronts. The export of coal and the import of timber pit props, both of which were huge parts of Hull's port trade. Hull Dock Company resumed their work on Junction Dock, getting the plans approved in 1824. It was begun in 1826 and the last stretch of Hull's town walls were finally demolished to make way for it. This dock was designed by James Walker with Thomas Thornton and John Timperley as resident engineers. They built on the lessons that had been learned with the previous docks. The dock walls used the same angled pilings as the new dock for instance. However the work was not without incident. When linking the old dock to Junction Dock in the area today known as Monument Bridge, Whilst they were dismantling the old cofferdam, 60 feet of the old dock walls collapsed and the debris had to be removed by the use of a diving bell. In 1829, Junction Dock finally opened. And in 1835, Monument Bridge gained its name. Monument Bridge was a dual lifting bridge that bridged the channel that led from Junction Dock into the old dock. And it gained its name from the monument of William Wilberforce, which stood not far away. A monument bridge was an absolute nightmare for road going traffic in the city of Hull because in those days there was so much business coming in and out of the docks that that bridge was often lifted up to eight times an hour, each occasion lasting five minutes for a ship to come through. Now that means that for a considerable stretch of most days it was actually open more than it was closed, which must have been incredibly annoying. The opening of Junction Dock also coincided with the completion of a canal network that linked Hull with the Midlands and the West Riding. And this had a colossal impact on the kind of trade that was coming in and going out through Hull's docks. We were starting to see lead from Derbyshire and hosiery from Nottingham, pottery from Staffordshire, all flooding through Hull's massive trade export docks. Hull really was exploding at this point and it was only a matter of time before further docks were going to be needed. In the late 1830s, the investors of Hull were once again asked if they wanted a railway. At this time, the threat posed by Gould to their businesses proved quite the motivator. The Hull and Selby Railway Company completed their line in 1840, terminating it at the dock that used to be called the New Dock, but now wasn't the New Dock because there was a newer dock. Naturally, it was at this time that the new dock became known as the Humber Dock. The old dock carried on being the old dock for a good few years to come. The railway built a goods station and a passenger station fronting onto Railway Street, known as the Manor House Street Station. Very rapidly, it became clear that the railway was the shot of adrenaline that Hull needed in its struggle to steal trade from Ghoul. Previously, goods had needed to be moved in days via canals. Now they could reach their destination in hours. This proved very attractive and opened up a whole new area of imports and exports, perishables. But we'll take a longer look at Hull's fruit and vegetable trade in a future episode. In the 1840s, trade through the docks continued to rise at an unparalleled rate. All three docks were working to full capacity and beyond. And one particular import was causing more than its fair share of problems, timber. Timber was a very important part of Hull's imports. They were shipping it to the coal fields of South Yorkshire for use as pit props and all across England to use with the railway industry. Because at this point, the entire railway network that we know today and more was being laid down 
a huge network of steel linking all of the major cities of England and Scotland and Wales and they needed the timber for sleepers. And the problem with the timber industry was that the timber was shipped as logs and there was no quayside ability to rapidly move all of those logs out of the ship and onto the quayside. You had to all do it by hand so they would have to wait for dock hands to come on board and lift the timber out. And these ship captains were uh, not very patient. They just wanted to be turning around and go off to get the next bunch. Time is money after all. So what they did is they'd turn up in the quay, push the logs over the side into the water and then leave. Which was a problem because when you drop a load of logs into the water they drift around and hit other ships and block up quayside space and get in the way of the lock gates. And a lot of damage was caused by the timber industry. But it was such an important thing that they couldn't just not import timber. So something needed to be done. And one solution that was put forward in the 1840s was the building of two separate docks very different in origin and very different in design. One was to be on the east side of the River Hull, over that way, and that would be a dedicated timber dock. It would have two entrances, one from the River Hull and a deep water one from the Humber itself, and it would have huge shallow timber ponds from which you could dump the timber into without having to offload it. The second dock would be a small dock, much smaller than the existing ones, but it would run alongside the railway station, just across the way there, the goods station, which ran all along there and off towards Selby. And it would be the railway dock, this dock, in fact. And even though it was small, that didn't matter because one of the things that it enabled you to do was to ship perishables into Hull and load them straight onto a train where they would be shipped within hours to their destination. That fast turnaround really built up a, a, a fruit trade and a veg trade for Hull, which we'll cover in a later episode. The Hull Dock Company approved berth plans and berth docks began construction in 1846. Both were designed by the same person, J.B. Hartley, and railway dock, this one, was the very last of the town docks to be built. In fact, for a long time, one thing that was a key part of Hull's skyline was the line of warehouses that stretched across the entire length of the southern side of the dock. These days, only that warehouse remains, converted into luxury apartments and uh, nice expensive restaurants. All the rest of them were demolished during the 1980s. Oh, and it also finally solved the issue of naming as well, because this was named Railway Dock. And in the 1850s, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert visited Hull which gave the excuse to rename the old dock to Queen's Dock and Junction Dock became Prince's Dock. They all actually had proper names for the first time in their history. Looks like they got better at naming things in the 1850s. Sadly, the town docks had had their day by the end of the 19th century. The development of screw-driven, iron-hulled steamships started a colossal growth in the size of ships being used to ship freight across the sea, and the relatively small town docks were simply incapable of handling such huge vessels. 
All of Hull's later docks, starting with Albert Dock in the 1860s, Alexandra Dock in the 1880s, and King George V Dock in the 1910s, took this new breed of giant vessels, and increasingly the old town docks were used to lay up river barges and the occasional trawler. The situation got so bad that in the 1920s, the owners of the docks, the London and North Eastern Railway Company, sold Queen's Dock to Hull Corporation, who drained it and filled it, turning it into a pleasure garden known to this day as Queen's Gardens. Prince's Dock was a regular parking ground for old barges which were tied off in the middle of the dock, and in the 1950s and 60s, it was not unusual to see a huge trawler laid up, towering over the Ferrens Art Gallery. Humber and railway docks still saw some use until the 1960s, but they had fallen into complete disrepair by the 1970s. The vast warehouses, standing empty and windowless, towering over the water and the once thriving quayside. The 1980s saw a slow change in fortune for all three of the remaining town docks. Railway and Humber docks became refurbished as Hull's Marina, a role they've been happily performing until the present day, teeming with pleasure craft, historical reproductions of old vessels, and the ever-present Spurn Lightship, now a floating museum. Most of the warehouses and the vast Railway Street goods yard were demolished, leaving nothing but rails running down the road, and one huge block of the warehouse on the corner between Railway and Humber docks, which was refurbished into luxury apartments and a restaurant. In the early 90s, Princess Dock became home to a giant shopping centre on stilts, Princess Quay, and the water level was lowered and fountains and fish introduced. The entrance to Humber Dock was permanently blocked by the construction of the new A63 Hesel Road. More recently, the fruit market that developed along Humber Street was revamped by artists into a thriving cultural area. And as we speak, a huge project is underway, bringing a new bridge so that people can more easily cross the busy A63 to get from the rest of town to this increasingly vital part of the city. Even the old basin just off the river Hull that led ships 250 years ago into the old dock, which was turned into a dry dock after the closure of Queen's Dock, is being refurbished to become the new home of the Arctic Corsair, a historic trawler and one of the last to sail from St Andrew's Dock, as part of Hull's new role as Yorkshire's maritime city. These docks, unlike most, enjoyed a rejuvenation because of their central location, and after decades out in the wilderness as their roles as docks were bypassed by newer and bigger docks, they are once again thriving and busy centres. Join me next time as we take a look at the construction of Victoria Dock and the port's timber trade. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel so that you get notified of any further videos. If you really like my videos and you'd like to help me make more of them, then please feel free to follow the links in the description below to my Patreon and GoFundMe pages.